Thank you for turning to page 121. Well, today's kind of exciting uh, video for me. This is my 300th posted video since I started the channel. I started the channel uh, October 29th of 2020. So it's not even two years old and I'm at 300 videos. It's pretty exciting for me. I never gave it any thought how many videos I'd post when I started the channel. But uh, I'm, I'm pretty pleased with how many I've been able to produce so far. I hope you guys like them. I hope you keep watching. On to today's topic. Traveler. What? Yes, Traveler. Today I'm going to start the first of my week of Traveler. I'm going to be devoting the entire week to Traveler videos of one type or another. Uh, this is not to say that I'm bailing in any way on any of the other games I play. Uh, not going to stop making videos. I, I will not stop making videos on AD&D, Gamma World, any of those that I have been making, I will continue to make. There are some Star Frontiers that I'm working on. Uh, Space Opera is going to make an appearance on the channel. Uh, there's even going to probably be a Battletech Bat Rep uh, in the near future. I've had an itch to play some Battletech. Uh, I'm not going to do anything on History Battletech. That's been done to death on the internet. But I am going to do a little bit of Battletech Bat Rep. That being said, this week's focus is going to be on Traveler. So we're going to start out with... A tough topic in Traveler, Psionics. I'm pulling my information out of this, the 2022 rulebook update. Psionics have been around in Traveler pretty much as long as there's been a Traveler. That being said, Psionics are very challenging in Traveler, and even in the 2022 update, there are some issues that uh, the GM will need to address when they decide that they're going to include a Psionic character, or even a Psionic NPC. So today I'm going to take a look at uh, Psionics, in Traveler. Uh, it's going to be how they work, uh, what way you expend points to do powers and things like that, a few suggestions that I have on ways to change and improve it, and a couple of house rules I had to do uh, to even get to this point. There's there's a little, I, it's a little confusing for me as to how you actually get some of the psionic abilities. So we're going to go into that a little bit and I'm going to show a little of my confusion. I don't, uh, really ever knock the core rulebook. I like this book a great deal. It's got some typos and a few errors here and there, but what book doesn't? I like this book a great deal. However, the psionic section, I've read five or six times now, and I really feel there's about five or ten pages missing out of the psionic section. Uh, I'm not sure that uh, everything that could have been in there made it to the final cut. So I'm going to go over that. I'm going to explain myself on that. Um, and hopefully you agree with me or, or have, you know, good counterpoints. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it should be this. Maybe it should be that. So that's going to be the, the point of today's video. Uh, also just want a friendly reminder. I am still looking for subscribers. Uh, that's going very well. Always trying to grow the channel. Uh, want to, uh, make the channel bigger and better. Get as many clicks as I can get. Uh, also I have a Patreon going right now. Um, any help you can give me that regard. I, I'm trying to upgrade some of my electronics. Uh, I'm going to need some capital to do that. Uh, I want to get an actual proper backdrop for Traveler, things like that. But that's enough of the commercial. Today's topic, Psionics in Traveler. Psionics in Traveler. Not an easy thing for the GM. <clears throat> Psionics have been around pretty much as long as there's been a Traveler. And it's always been a bit of a challenge. My first introduction to role-playing Psionics was in the uh, AD&D rulebooks. Psionics is a thing in <clears throat> original AD&D, first edition, uh, which we quickly removed. I never felt Psionics fit in a fantasy magic, high magic game. But I do fit, feel it fits beautifully in science fiction. Specifically, I think it fits well in Traveler. As I said, Psionics is a challenging topic. Case in point. This is my third take of making this video. And when I say take, I'm saying I have already dumped two other versions of this video that I've finished. One made it through final edit and all the way onto the internet. It was a uh, pending release on, uh, on YouTube and I decided to dump it. So uh, hopefully this uh, take will go a little bit better than I feel those other did. Um, hopefully you like this video. So back to the topic at hand, psionics. On page 228 of the Psionic, or the uh, 2022 update, we have Psionics. What the heck are they? They are basically powers of the mind. Uh, you use your mind to affect the world in an external kind of way. Generally, although there's an exception to that. But uh, generally, 
your mind directly interfaces with the world. I know your mind always directly interfaces with the world. I'm saying in a way that you can mani mani manipulate things, project your thoughts, that kind of thing. That is what psionics is in a very basic explanation. So basically, uh, in Traveler, a few humans and aliens have developed potent psionic abilities such as telepathy, telekinesis, and even teleportation. Learning to properly control them is never easy and cannot always be relied upon. And then we have the Imperium, psionics and the law. For various reasons that I'm going to go into in another video, psionics are not legal in the Imperium itself. I will talk about the psionic suppressions in a forthcoming video. <clears throat> psionic strength. When you decide you want to have psionics, and there are a couple of different ways you can have your psionics be a thing in Traveler, but ultimately when you decide you want to have your psionics, the main thing you have to get is your GM's approval. And this I completely agree with. <clears throat> GMs always have to approve a psionic character because a psionic character can easily skew a game. It's not hard, not hard at all for a psionic character to kind of take over a game and before you know it, the entire game is focused on the guy's mental abilities. I've always kind of laughed about uh, Riker in uh, Star Trek Next Generation. While I like the character just fine, he kind of gets lost because all the other characters around him kind of have some form of, like, different power, kind of a superpower. You've got Worf, who's a full Klingon. You've got Deanna Troy, who is a Scion. <clears throat> You've got Commander Data, who is an android, and you've got Geordi with his, his visor. And then you've got plain old Riker. So I always felt he kind of got lost a little bit in the shuffle of various supers that were on that show. I realize Worf isn't super, but he still fits what I'm saying. So I always felt Commander Riker got a little lost in there, and uh, that can happen with your psionic campaign. It's, it's easy for the psionic character to overshadow the others. And for you as the GM, without even realizing it, to start focusing a lot of your campaign on the psionic character. So caution is needed both for the player and the, the GM. Psionics are literally a game changer. So to determine your psionic strength, your GM has said yes, and you want to see if you have psionics. Uh, the first thing you're going to do is determine your psionic strength, and that is you throw two die six. If you throw two die six and you generate a number that is six or higher, congratulations, you have trainable psionic talent. There are some modifiers to this. I'm going to go into first how you can play psionics with a character. There are a couple of different ways. One is you can get it during character generation. On page 46 of this book, I'm not going to go to it, I'll just describe it. Page 46 of this book, you have the life table for your character generation. If you throw two sixes on that table, that gets you a special event. If that you throw a one on the subtable of special events, you have a chance to encounter a psionic institute. And you have a chance to be trained as a scion, so then you would roll again with GM's permission and see if you have psionic abilities. You can add that to a character during character creation, or you can just go to your GM and say, hey, I'd like to see if this guy has any psi potential. But for every term you have served in any service, cumulative, it's a minus on your die roll. So my example before was I needed a six or greater. Now I've served three terms and I decide, hey, I've been in the scouts quite a while. I've always had this feeling that, you know, I was a little psychic. Maybe I'll find out. Hey, GM, after my third turn, I want to see if I have psionics. Well, that gives me a minus three roll on my psionic check for each term used. The theory being that psionics are a skill, a muscle, like anything else, and will atrophy without use. So as you've gotten older and gotten less used to having any kind of psionic potential, your psionic potential itself is diminished. So to get my six, in this case with the minus three die modifier, I would have to roll a natural nine. So that's one way to get it. The other way to get it is to uh, go ahead and take the scion character career. I want to be a scion, and that's going to be my career. So I, if that's in the back of the book, and I'm going to get to it in a moment. And that's your very first thing. You're, you're going to be a scion from the get-go. A good example of those characters in, in science fiction are two of my frequent go-tos, Star Trek Next Generation, Deanna Troy. Absolutely a scion first. She was raised with her psionic abilities, with her psionic mother, and then chose to go to a career of being a counselor. So she is someone who took her scion career and then went to the counselor. Uh, Alfred Bester, a great bad guy, 
uh, played by Walter Koenig in the old Babylon 5 series. By the way, recommend that series highly. If you haven't seen it, put in the time. It's it's a fun series. Even the, the first ser season, trudge your way through. Uh, it builds, and everything for the first four or five seasons builds into each other. But Alfred Bester is our bad guy, played by Walter Koenig in Babylon 5, and he is a scion. He is what they call a P-12. He's a really powerful scion, and uh, he works for Psychor, and he's a bad guy who may not be such a bad guy. Uh, he's a very interesting, very dynamic character. So there's good, two good examples of how you can build the scion character without... Uh, from the get-go and not have another career on it. We'll get to that in a moment, but I'm going to go back to this now. So I've got my psionic strength. For purposes of today's uh, video, I'm going to say my psionic strength is a 9. If I rolled as a scout and I was three terms in, I threw a natural 12, two sixes, minus 3 becomes my 9, or as a scion, I threw a 9 naturally. The reason I'm choosing a 9 is because that's what's used in the examples throughout this section, and it would just be easier for me, uh, and I think as you read this, for you to just have my examples start with a 9. So I'm going to go with a 9. So congratulations, I'm psionic and I'm a 9. You could call me a P9. I'm a psionic 9. I have 9 strength points. Strength points are what I spend to do my psionic abilities. So my, my psionic abilities, you know, telepathy with another scion, another telepath, would only cost me one psionic strength point. And then these points diminish as I use my psionics. And then after a period of rest, they come back. And you recover your psi at a rate of, after the first three hours, you recover nothing. Then you recover one psi point per hour. So if I spent all nine of my psi points in a day... I did them all at once within you know the first 20 minutes of the day. I've, I've spent all 12, all nine of my points. It would take me three hours of not having any come back because my brain is just exhausted and kind of retooling. And then it would be one point per hour after that. So after a total of 12 hours, I would have all of my side points back. I can expend side points even when I'm diminished. So if I've only recovered four side points, but I need to use them again, I can. It's perfectly acceptable. So now we go to Institute Testing, and I'm not going to do much on the Institute Testing because like the Psionic Law, I'm going to be doing a video on uh, Psionic Institutes, and I'm going to handle all of this in there. So now we're going to go to your Telepathic Potential. There are five different areas of uh, Psionic training you can engage in. Telepathy, Clairvoyance, Telekinesis, Awareness, and Teleportation. I'll explain each one as I get into the section and show all the powers you get if you get into that one or, or one of the others. So what I want to do is I want to, I've become my scion, I've got nine points, and now I'm going to choose my telepathic potential. Which route am I going to go? Now if I take telepathy, which gives me a plus four on my learning die modifier, and what this means is my learning DM is how easy it is for me to learn. Telepathy is a more natural thing, so it's a, a plus four bonus. So if I decide after a while that I'm going to go for telepathy, I get a plus four to my bonus roll. But I suffer a couple of negative modifiers, too, and we'll get to that in a moment. So I have to choose these, but and I can choose it in any order I want, and I can try for all five. And it's not impossible for you to have a psionic character walking around with all five powers. It would just take a little bit of good rolling. So you've got to be careful uh, when you do this. Uh, and as a GM, you might want to think if there's something you want to do to limit uh, characters. Uh, for my thinking, now I have not playtested this. I don't have a Scion or Scionic character running around in my current Traveler campaign. But I've run many Scionic characters over the years in virtually every iteration of Traveler. Except Mongoose second. Uh, or Mongoose first and second. I've never run one in either version. Uh, but... Be careful. They can really skew it. And the ability to have all five of these with all the various attendant abilities is really a, a literal game changer again. So what I'm going to be doing, I think, when I go forward with this, is I'm going to allow uh, any character, Scion, any Psy, I'm going to allow to have one power plus one per uh, bonus for their level. In other words, a nine gets me a plus one bonus. 
So I would allow that character to have up to two slots out of these five. I feel that that's going to really keep me from getting overwhelmed with this Super Scion running around. Uh, and on the other hand, it's not going to uh, limit the character. He can still have two of these. So if someone were to roll, say, seven for their Psy power, they are still a Psy, but they can only have one base power in, in my proposed way of doing it. Uh, it's just, to me, uh, awareness, or tel telepathy, rather, and uh, teleportation are just kind of different things. And I'm just thinking, well, maybe the brain doesn't work quite like that. So I'm going to, I'm probably going to limit it to one plus whatever your, your bonus is for your Psy strength. So in this case, we're going to go ahead and we're going to read the example down here. Luca has just determined she's a Psy of nine. She now rolls to determine talents. She can select powers in any order, so she begins with telekinesis. Telekinesis gives a plus two. She can roll two die six plus one, her Psy DM, for having a nine, plus two for telekinesis, learning DM. The die roll is a three for a total of six, less than the number she needs. She does not gain telekinesis. And these are one and dones, with an exception, and I'll get to that in a moment. But these are one and dones. Once I've tested for something and I've failed on it, I can't go back to it. Each time I roll on this table, I accrue a cumulative minus one check. So if I failed on two of these, the third one I checked on, I would have a chance to a, a minus two die modifier on that. I might not get any of these powers. The nice thing is, if I start as a scion and I choose telepathy as my very first power, and by the way, telepathy is incredibly useful, uh, I get that automatically. So I don't have to roll for anything. There's no chance of being a scion without psionic powers. By the way, working with your GM, if you rolled abysmally on this chart as the GM, I would just say, okay, that was a fun practice round. Now let's do it for real. Don't roll so bad. So that's how I would do. So now we're going to go to the next part of this. And uh, our friend Luca, uh, she tries for telepathy. She doesn't get it automatically because she didn't choose it first. So she rolls her two die six plus one, her psi die modifier, plus four for the learning die modifier, minus one for having previously rolled on the check, and gets a 10. Luca gains telepathy zero. She has telepathy, yay. So now that we have telepathy, we're going to go into psionic talents. And the talents, as I said before, telepathy, clairvoyance, awareness, uh, telekinesis, awareness, and teleportation. Telepathy is reading minds and communicating. Clairvoyance is perceiving at a distance. Telekinesis is mind over matter. Awareness is control over one's own mind and body. And teleportation is moving your body from one point to, an to another instantly. And you use the psionic powers. You have to make a skill check with the appropriate modifiers. And if you succeed on that number or higher, congratulations, you have the psi power. Or you, you've enacted the psi power. If you fail to get it, if I need an 8 for my number and I roll a 3 with modifiers, I roll a 5, I still fail. I only expend one psionic point, not what the psionic point value is listed for the, uh, the talent. Which is nice, because then I'm, I'm not risking 4 points to use this talent, and if I blow the roll, I'm out the 4 points. So I did like that. And then psi powers, most of them can be used at uh, range distances. And here's the range band table for what you can do. And you can increase the range if you need to by paying twice the side cost. So if I have to use telepathy and I have to go twice the normal distance, then I can just, instead of paying one for my telepathy, I would pay two in that case because I'm increasing my range. The next section we come to is using the Scion career, and we'll get to that uh, under its own section. I do want to go back one thing to psionic poten telepathic potential. Uh, it, it doesn't really come out. I can't find it. Maybe someone's seen it and I've just missed it. That happens sometimes. I can't find my number, my target number for this, so I chose an 8. Uh, an average uh, challenge to get a, a talent uh, or to get the uh, talent group. I just chose 8 as my target number. If anybody knows differently, please let me know. But I really couldn't find anything here that called it out. So I felt 8 was a fair number. I felt 6 which is a little, I thought that was too easy, so I went with an 8. So now we go to the talents themselves. First off, before the talents start, they talk about special powers. I love that about the current mindset of Mongoose. They're saying right here, there's psionic powers way beyond what we're calling out in this book. They're called out in other previous Traveler things or you know, current Mongoose Traveler, whatever. You can add whatever you need to add, but here's what we're going to start with as our base. I like that. 
I like that they admit right away, yeah, there's plenty of other things you can do. Examples they give is precognition, elect electrokinesis, telepathic control, or astral projection. I like that. I like that right away they're telling us, yeah, there's others you can do. Here's the ones we narrowed down for this book. So now we go to telepathy, mind-to-mind -mind contact. And under telepathy, we have the most of the talents of any of these, which is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine talents. By the way, by becoming a telepath, just having telepathy zero, as they refer to it in the book, you automatically have all nine of these. You don't have to make any kind of check or anything to gain these powers. You are considered to be trained up or naturally gifted in all, use of all of these powers. That's really strong. So basically, I'm just going to do these very quickly, uh, each of the talents that you get. I don't want this video to be you know, too long. So first off would be life detection, which is an easy check on a four up. The reach is distant, and it costs you one side point. This lets you see, oh, are there, is there anybody in that room beyond that door? That door is closed. I go ahead and I do life detection. Uh, mind link. Yeah, you can use this with another telepath to communicate mentally. Again, going back to Deanna Troy, Deanna and her mother communicate telep telepathically. It's an easy uh, roll also. A psi cost of one, but the other telepath has to allow it. He's got to let you pass his shield, and we'll get to that in a moment couple of questions regarding the shield that I, I feel the shield wasn't brought out enough. Telepathy, basically empathy. I can feel what another creature or beast is feeling. So uh, if I want to know if this guy's happy, if he's mad, if he's glad to be part of this, I'm, I'm, I'm doing some kind of deal with this guy and I want to get a read on his emotions. Telepathy is good. It's a routine six check. Reaches long and it's a size one. Also, if I have a dog that I'm trying to train or whatever, I can then use my telepathy to tell what's going on in the dog's mind and help me with the training. Read surf, surface thoughts. Basically, you know, don't think about the safe combination. Bam. They think about the safe combination. Read surface thoughts. It is a check of eight, long range, and psych cost of two if I really want to read their surface thoughts. Send thoughts. This would be sending to a uh, non-telepathic individual. Uh, telepaths can close their uh, shield to someone sending them thoughts. Difficulty is 10 up, it's distant, and it's a high cost of 2. Suggestion. I can give an idea to someone. This is not a charm. This is not making them my puppet. It's simply a suggestion I could put in their head. You suggest maybe, hey, you know, the price they're offering me is really good. You plant that in there, they say, hey, that price is really good, and they go with it. It's a very difficult check and a 12 up. Range is short and the psi cost is three. Probe. I really want to do a deep dive into somebody. I've got to find out all they know about Project X. I can then do a deep probe into them. It's a very difficult check and a 12 up. Range is close and it costs me four. Psi assault. Violence can be dealt by a telepath against unshielded mind. The result is automatic unconsciousness and possible death. A shielded mind we end up into a duel. Uh, if I win, you are rendered unconscious immediately, and I get a effect times three damage. Or an unshielded mind, when assaults a telepathic, is rendered unconscious immediately and causes effect times three damage. So if my effect is a one, I do three damage, and I knock him out right away. It doesn't say how long he's unconscious for, uh, which is going to be a bit of a thing for the GM to figure out. And then when a shielded mind is assaulted, so another telepath, the two telepaths oppose, make opposed telepathy checks. If the attacker wins, the victim suffers damage. If the defender wins, the should say, if the defender wins, then they suffer no damage. And then I wouldn't mind if this addressed maybe the possibility of rebounding some of the assault onto the attacker as the defender, but it doesn't say it, so I wouldn't necessarily go with it. That's a formidable, formidable 14, short range, and the side cost is 8. So that's a, a powerful one if you get it through. And then you have a shield. Once you have telepathy, you automatically have a shield. It's up all the time. You can drop it if you want. Uh, so I want to drop my shield and let, let somebody talk to me with the mind link or with send thoughts. Here's the thing. There are a couple things in the shield that are not brought up. Uh, it's automatically enforced all the time, requires no psi to maintain, and can be lowered to allow telepathic contact or use of telepathic powers. This needs to be expanded a lot, I feel. First off, if I have my shield up, can I tell another telepath wants to, to talk to me? Can I feel them knocking on the door? It doesn't tell me. Also, can I have my shield open to this Psy who wants to talk to me 
but now I get sonically assaulted by someone else I didn't know was there. Is my shield down for everybody or just down for this one side? It doesn't say. Also, I think shield should have a strength. In my case, it should be a passive P9 because I have nine strength points. As I expend psionic strength throughout the day, the shield should weaken. I'm becoming fatigued. It's. I think it just adds a lot more dynamic to the shield itself. I think these are some, some changes that need to be made. And as I said at the top, I felt that this was maybe five or ten pages shorter than it should have been. Uh, I wouldn't mind seeing these expanded on. There's a forthcoming uh, Secret of the Ancients coming out that Mongoose has teased uh, coming out next year. I'm hoping that they expand the psionics in that and that we get just a cleaner rule set out of it. These rules are workable, but the GM's going to have to spend some time and, and write quite a bit down to make these rules really happen. Our next section is clairvoyance. This allows you to perceive something at a distance. And there are talents under this, as all the others. There are one, two, three, four, five talents. And the talents are sense. It just gives you a rudimentary sense of what's What's outside the airlock? What's, what's out there? Oh, there's a cargo crane. I can kind of get a sense of what's out there. There's a room containing four dogs beyond, beyond that door. Uh, that kind of thing. It's a routine check at a six up. I can go very distant with it and it's high cost of one. <clears throat> Tactical awareness. Hey, Spidey Sense. I like this. I like this power a lot. Basically, I make an average eight check up to long range and two side cost. And it allows you to ignore the effects of darkness, smoke, fog, and other environmental things that impede vision. I can detect hidden foes within range. And the check, it'll last, uh, determine, the effect of the check determines how long it lasts. So if I got an effect of two, then it would last two rounds. I like that. I like that power a lot. Tactical awareness, you know when bad guys are hiding in the darkness waiting for you. We have clairvoyance. An average check of eight, very distant, one psi cost. It allows you to view something at a displaced point. The big meeting's going on with the big bad evil guys in the other room. You go ahead and you spy on it mentally. Now we have clear audience. Now we want to hear what's going on in the meeting. We can't see it. We can only hear it. Again, it's an average eight check, very distant, one psi cost. Or clear sentience, both. Travelers capable of both seeing and hearing a specific situation by using this power. It is a check of ten, very distant, and one psi cost. Doesn't say how long that I can keep these uh, going. Uh, yeah, it doesn't really go into that. Uh, there are some other sections where it talks about it, so you can extrapolate from it. Uh, I probably would allow them to keep going as long as they expended one side cost, maybe per minute if I was in a mood, maybe per combat round, uh, depending on how I was feeling. But probably once one side cost per minute to expend it, so if they want to watch a five minute meeting, it would be the initial one, and then they want to watch four more minutes, I would make charge them four more. It's just how I would do it. This is off the cuff. I have not formalized any of my rules for my setting with this. Telekinesis. Talent that allows you to manipulate objects without physically touching them. You manipulate with your mind. The basic form allows you to move stuff with your mind as telekinesis. It's an average eight check, short range, and it's one psi cost per 10 kilogram. Kilogram is roughly 2.2 pounds. So if you're going to lift a 200 pound person or let's say a 190 pound person, that's going to cost you 90 or nine psi points to lift them. Um, the number of psi points uh, spent determines the, ma the mass that can be moved. Uh, the duration is the effect check, the effect of the check. So... I would always allow if telekinesis if he made it, but the effect was zero because he got the exact number. I would still allow him to do something with the telekinesis. Maybe a little telekinesis toss or push or something. Flight. You can actually fly with this. Um, you can fly up to 15 meters per round, and your number of rounds is equal to the effect. It's a difficulty of 10. The range is just you. You cannot do this in someone else. And the side cost is 5. Telekinetic punch. I can go ahead and punch you in the face with my telekinesis. Uh, use a direct attack, smashing a foe with a blast of telekinetic force. Damage inflicted is equal to the effect. Protection from any armor is applied as normal. Your effect is probably not going to be real high, so if he's taking away two to four to six on his armor, you're probably not going to get much out of the telekinetic punch. I would probably make that just dice damage. Average check is eight. It's short range, and it's high cost of one. Microkinesis. I think this is the nastiest one in this chart. 
and uh, it's a more challenging form that allows manipulation of very small or even microscopic objects. A telekinetic can use this power to pick locks, perform microsurgery, sabotage a computer system, and so forth. The check is difficult, 10 up. It is close, and it is a size 3. And one of my players asked immediately when I mentioned this, oh, can I just remove, you know, an artery from this guy and have him bleed out? And I went, oh, let's see, you'd be close. It doesn't say you have to have line of sight. If you have knowledge of anatomy, there's no real reason why you couldn't just disconnect some important tube inside their body. So, I don't know. <laughs> Again, something on the cutting room floor. I think that needed to be fleshed out a little bit more. I've got to think about that. Fortunately, it's not anything I have to deal with immediately in my campaign. As I said, I don't have any scions in my campaign. Pyrokinesis. Exciting the molecules of a, a sub subject matter. Uh, to raise its temperature, and the effect gives me what happens. So if I were to get an effect of 9 up, suffers 2 die damage, and may burst into flame if flammable. It's a routine check, short range, and 3 cost. Next we come to awareness. These are self only. These are ones that only affect your own body. We start with suspended animation, where you can put yourself into a suspended animation state. You don't, expend any, you don't have any need for food or water. You don't need to expend... Uh, breathing, things like that, uh, and you can be awakened from it. And let's see, the check is an 8, and it's high cost of 3. Enhanced strength, you can buff up your strength. Uh, the effect of the awareness times 10, and then it drops down 1 per point after that. So if I really need to you know, lift that crate and get it out of the way so we can escape the bad guys, you know, I can enhance my strength and do it. Enhanced endurance works the exact same way, average 8 strength. Uh, check of eight and whatever I increase it. So if I, my strength or endurance went up eight points, I would be spending eight psionic points to do that. Fortitude. You could theoretically, I would allow somebody to go to ridiculous level strength. If his natural strength somehow was a 12 and he wanted to expend eight points of his nine to do enhanced strength, I'd let him go to a 20 strength and I'd figure it out on the fly. Same with endurance. Fortitude. You can increase your the, your skeletal structure and your, boost your healing rate. You can uh, basically enhances your ability to absorb damage. Fortitude lasts a number of rounds equal to the effect of the uh, check. Provides protection equal to the number of psi points expended. So if the amount of armor is my psi cost. If I want an armor five and this stacks with armor worn, so I'm wearing an armor two suit and I want it to stack and I need to get to a seven for whatever reason, I can go ahead and expend five here. It's difficulty ten. Inspiration. Flash of momentary inspiration, dexterous fine-tuning, and momentary, momentarily toughened physique. It adds a die modifier of plus two to any one check you, you try within the next minute. That's a good one. I like that one. And that's one that also you're going to need the GM's help for. It is an average check of eight and costs one psi point. Regeneration. You can heal. And you make your check at a difficulty ten, and however many points you expend is how many you heal. Very valuable in Traveler, which is a, a damage lethal game. Uh, I play with a modified hit point pool, so rege regeneration is not going to be as valuable in mine, but still, it's it's a valuable thing. And now we come down to the last one, which is teleportation. This is the only talent under teleportation, because let's face it, you don't need another one. Uh, it's an average check of 8. You can go distant, and your side cost is 2. To take your clothing, it costs an additional 2 PSI, Two psi, and if you want to take heavy equipment, uh, battle armor, that kind of thing, uh, Zodani Death Commando would be expending an additional four. So he'd be, with clothing, you'd be a four to teleport, and with armor, it'd be six. You have to be trained in both. Uh, it always involves movement from one body to the other. You pre knowledge your destination, you always have to have an idea of where you're going. You can't just kind of teleport blind. And then energy and momentum, they go into a lot here. Basically, the big deal in this is changes in altitude. If I, uh, that results in energy changes, a jump of one kilometer straight down results in internal temperature in the increase of two and a half Celsius, uh, sufficient to cause extreme fever, brain damage, death. Uh, if I go up, then I suffer extreme cooling and have a similar kind of problem. So jumping straight from a starship to its planet's surface is a good way to turn yourself into street pizza. Psionic technology, we're not going to get into. I'm going to cover that in another video as well. But I'm going to go to the Scion. So now we're going to take a look at the Scion as a just a place that you can start your career.
And now last but not least, certainly not least in this marathon video, sorry this is going so long folks, but as I've said, psionics is a tricky topic. Uh, we have the Scion career, a career for travelers who choose to focus on their psionic potential instead of more conventional lifestyles. Your qualification is a Psy roll of six up, your die modifier is minus one for every previous career. I've already gone over that. Your assignments, you choose one of the three following. You have a wild talent. You develop your powers without formal training. You're adept. You've been trained uh, properly in the psionic disciplines and a psi warrior. You combine combat training with psionic warfare. So you have the career pros uh, progress here. As a wild, your survival is your soch at a six up and your advancement is intelligence eight up. As an adept, your survival is an education four up and advancement is an education eight up. And as a Psy Warrior, it's Endurance 6-Up with an Endurance 6-Up for Advancement. So that's pretty straightforward. It's not that challenging to uh, go forward with this career. I like Scion as a, a career. Uh, mustering out benefits, you can get some nice stuff for your benefits. A gun, two ship shares, a contact, TAS membership, another contact, gun combat, and then 10 ship shares. So you can get some pretty nice mustering out benefits. So now we're going to come down here and you've got your, your standard personal development and you've got your service skills. And then in your education, which is your minimum education of eight or greater, your advanced education skills, language, art, electronics, medic, science, and mechanic. And then, of course, your individual skills based on what you are, your wild talent, adept, or psi warrior. Here's the part that gets, for me, a little confusing. If I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to roll for service skills. I have telepathy and telekinesis. Those will be the two powers I've ended up with. All right. I throw for my service skills and I throw a one. I throw telepathy. The book says I get to roll for that if I had previously rolled and not made it. But it doesn't say what happens if I have the talent and then roll it on this chart. Is it just a do-over? Do I roll again? Or does something else happen? Well, first we're going to discuss the roll again. If I had telepathy and I allowed a roll again, if I rolled it, then I would get, say, clairvoyance. I had said earlier that I'm going to limit my Psy character to only have one talent plus his die modifier of number of talents. So my guy with a nine would have two talents maximum. I, as GM, if he were to roll clairvoyance on this, what this does, per the rules, is gives him another chance at the clairvoyance table. So he would go ahead and he could roll again to see if he gets clairvoyance. If he got that and he made the success, successful roll, I would allow him to have clairvoyance. So this is another way that even despite my limitation, you could end up potentially with all five. Here's the bad news. You're still suffering any modifier for previous rolls on that chart. So if clairvoyance offers a bonus roll, I'm going to go to clairvoyance and see what the bonus roll is. Clairvoyance is a plus three, but I've already rolled on that chart three times. That's a net zero, and I'm using an eight as my uh, number, plus the die modifier of plus one, so I'm in a nine. Sorry, I need a seven, so I have to throw an actual seven in order to get that talent. So that's one way to handle it, handle any duplicate that I've already got telepathy, I've already got telekinesis. If I roll those, I just do them as a, a roll again, or the way I'm toying with doing, and I like better, is if I land on telepathy, then I get one extra side point to be expended in telepathy only. So my side talent in telepathy only would be a 10, not a 9. If I rolled telepathy three times, I would gain plus three side points usable only in telepathy. That makes me much more excited about this chart than just a bunch of rollovers and ending up with every power in the book. I don't like the idea of somebody ending up with every power in the book. So that's a, an alternate way to go that I think I'm going to use. Now, I have not playtested this. This is just something I considered while I was uh, reading this over and making these videos. As I said, this is my third time through actually making this video. So I've had a lot of time to think about this. But this is something I may playtest a little bit, maybe get together with my uh, sons and just run a short game where they're both scions and, they, and we see how this plays out with the extra points per the talent. And then uh, we go to here with your... Uh, progress based on your your character your ranks and bonuses as a wild talent adept and a psi warrior and then you have your mishap, mishap and your events table mishap and event tables i like them a lot i really do 
They're a nice alternative to dying in character creation, although I love that too. Uh, but I don't let a mishap or an event dramatically change the character. I don't make them incur a bunch of medical debt coming into the, the character. I realize Traveler is about money, but let's face it, somebody, maybe they're struggling with a little debt in real life. The last thing they're going to want is the role play a character who's struggling with debt. I don't dwell on that kind of stuff too much, so maybe they've lost their limb, but it's regrown, and maybe for a while I throw a die modifier when they use that that particular limb, or their, if it's one of their legs that was regrown, maybe they're minus one foot speed for a while, until they get more used to the new leg. Same with events, I don't let them be uh, tremendously life-altering here. In one of these events, you, you gain some money. You know, you have a book published and gain a little extra money as the example. That's great. But, you know, I'm not going to have your billionaire uncle die and leave you as the sole heir either. So I'm not going to go too far either direction with either of these charts. But I do like these charts. It's a nice touch by, by Mongoose. So that's it. We're out. Yay, we've reached the end of the video. I want to thank you for your, your marathon and your, your high endurance checks to make it through this long with me. For me, as I said, this is my third time through it. I have filmed something like two hours worth of video to get to this point. <laughs> So I'm glad it's done. I, I enjoyed making this video. I love psionics. I obviously have put a lot of thought into psionics. I love them in Traveler. I just feel that this section entirely needed about another five to ten pages to flesh out, and particularly the talents, I feel were left a little short. There are plenty of other places you can draw talents from, not the least of which is at any superhero game. I play Champions. Uh, Gamma World has a ton of them. Space Opera. Uh, there's a bunch of places you can draw different talents from to talk about the special powers here. Other Traveler uh, iterations also have different powers. Uh, so you're certainly not limited to this, but as the GM, write it down. Have it ready. Have your explanations ready for your players and your limitations. You do not want these to become superpowers. You don't need Professor X wandering around your Space Opera uh, setting and, and throwing everything on its, on its rear. So that's it for today from page 121. Thank you. Thank you for 300 episodes and counting. And I uh, hope you enjoyed this Traveler video, the first of my Traveler week. Again, I'll be going back to other videos right after this week. But for one week, I'm going to really indulge my Traveler uh, fandom, uh, both mine and my viewers. And I'm, I'm going to really engage in Traveler. So that's it for today from page 121. Thank you for your time. Thanks for uh, watching. If you liked what you heard, heard and saw, please like and subscribe. Uh, tell your friends, don't forget about the Patreon, and I'll see you next time on page 121.